My name is Dietrich Stout. I'm the uh, Associate Director of Emory Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture, uh, which is bringing you today's presentation by Dr. Chicago Azawa da Silva. She is a, uh, an Associate Professor of Anthropology in the Department of Anthropology at Emory University. Uh, her research focuses on cross-cultural understandings of well-being uh, by bringing Western and Asian perspectives on the mind, body, religion, medicine, and therapy into fruitful dialogue. Uh, her publications include two monographs, The Anatomy of Loneliness, Suicide, Social Connection, and the Search for Relational Meaning in Contemporary Japan, which I believe she'll be elaborating on today, um, that is out from the University of California Press in 2021, and uh, Psychotherapy and Religion in Japan. The Japanese Introspection Practice of Nikon, which uh, was published by Routledge in 2006. Uh, she has also uh, contributed to co-editing a special issue toward an anthropology of loneliness in transcultural psychology out in 2020, uh, and has over 20 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on psychotherapeutic practice, suicide, and the mind-body relationship uh, in Tibetan medicine. So today, I believe she will be speaking about her work on the anatomy of loneliness. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming Dr. Chicago Azawa da Silva. Thank you so much, Deet, for your wonderful introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Stout uh, for inviting me to present. So when we had this interview inside the lab, we kind of laughed that, well, this case, it really is like outside the lab. I am a social cultural anthropologist, so therefore I don't do any work inside the lab, but um, I actually think loneliness is a topic that really is inevitably very interdisciplinary, and I hope there will be something that is interesting to uh, every one of you who came here. Thank you so much for your time. So let me try to share the screen. So Today, I would like to talk about loneliness and what I call uh, Lonely Society that is based on my forthcoming book, The Anatomy of Loneliness and the Special Issue Toward the Anthropology of Loneliness from Transcultural Psychiatry. So this book is coming out uh, in early December and Amazon being Amazon, you can already pre-order my book. So if you find any aspects of this talk, interesting, relevant to your research, your personal interest. Um, I hope you have a chance to take a look at this book. So as Theresa May uh, famously stated, that the loneliness is one of the greatest public health challenges of our time, and appointed the very first minister for loneliness in the UK, so loneliness has been increasingly recognized as a public health issue, impacting on physical health of individuals and negatively impacting on mortality. So nowadays, if you Google anything like loneliness epidemics, you will see so many um, articles from New York Times, Guardian, to list a few. And uh, some data show that more than a third of American citizens over the age of 40 are feeling lonely. And the loneliness and the social isolation are associated with reduced lifespan. Just like what happens if you smoke uh, 15 cigarettes a day. And talking about chronic loneliness, Chronic loneliness is associated with changes in gene expression that make the body more susceptible to illness. Uh, Steve Cole at the UCLA has done very fascinating uh, research of seeing how chronic loneliness increase expression of pro-inflammation genes. So I think I don't need to convince about epidemics of loneliness. So this is uh, about this uh, special issue that me and my colleagues put together from the transcultural psychiatry. So in this special issue, we try to kind of go beyond the public health perspective to advance an understanding of loneliness as a social phenomenon. In the introduction article, we argued that 
recognizing that the loneliness affects a large number of people as in the public health perspective is a first step. But this population level perspective is different from recognizing that loneliness is a structure of sociality that impacts everyone. So what do I mean by it impacts everyone? So in my book, I argue that the loneliness is everybody's business. I even argued that it is wrong to divide us human beings into two camps, meaning some people are lonely, others are not. It is a false dichotomy. And it also almost evoked this kind of disease model that some people have loneliness as if they have a disease versus others don't healthy. And how is that the case? So I actually argue that, uh, you know, loneliness has this kind of an evolutionary, biological and psychological basis that make loneliness as a universal phenomenon. First, we are social animals. I think it doesn't take much explanation. Survival depends on belonging. or mammals and birds depend on maternal care. Social rejection and exclusion result in danger or death. In social culture anthropology, we often talk about this concept in a known phenomenon as a social death. Once people lose reputation within the community, sometimes that leads to a premature death. At the same time, we are individuals. What I mean is the very sense that, you know, that how we develop our sense of who we are, our identity, comes from separating ourselves from the others. So this differentiation is key in the way we develop our sense of selfhood and identity. So what happens here is really together, it's like a tug of war. There, is a two, there are two results in inherent tension and potential for loneliness. We have this deep biological needs to belong and share a world. At the same time, there is increasing realization that we do not always belong or share common feelings, perceptions, and beliefs. It's known that, you know, in the, the theory of mind, that the children do not know when they are very young that uh, other people don't know what they're thinking in their mind. And eventually they start realizing, well, maybe actually I am not sharing my world with others. So that's kind of how we develop mentally as a human adults. Furthermore, I argue that the structures of society can help or make worse this inherent condition. So the overview of today's talk, I'll talk about what is not loneliness. There are so many actually misunderstandings or conflation, I should say, when it comes to loneliness. We think we know what loneliness is, but actually we should st stop and think about what it is. And then I would like to talk about what is loneliness. I would like to focus on loneliness is a feeling and loneliness can involve places and environment and not just people. We have relationship with people but we also have relationships with places and environment. Third, I would like to talk about conditions of what I call lonely society. And next, I would like to talk about triangulating methods and critical empathy as a method to study subjective experiences such as loneliness. And I would like to briefly talk about why it is important to consider culture when you study loneliness and some of the concluding remarks. So I'll say the common myth number one is conflating loneliness with depression. Loneliness is a form of depression or the symptom of underlying depression. Um, this is quite a common view and I actually randomly selected and I chose six images out of typing a word loneliness and also typing a word depression. Of course, to some of you, maybe you can see 
easily. Yeah, these three uh, images of depression and these others uh, loneliness, maybe. So the right image, three images on the right came from typing a word loneliness and the left ones came from typing a word depression. They are not exactly the same, but we also see high resemblance among these images. So scholars argue that depression is the broader concept in the sense that depressed people are not always lonely. Same goes for loneliness. People who are lonely are not always depressed. Depression is a general feeling of sadness, hopelessness, or dejection, while loneliness involves feelings of social pain induced from feeling and perceiving a lack of close or meaningful relationships, connections, and belonging. For John Cacioppo, who really is the leading figure in the research of loneliness, he argued that the depression is self-oriented while loneliness is relation-oriented. So loneliness is a subjective experience focused on the perceived lack of fulfillment with regard to relationships. It is ultimately self-focused in that it involves focusing on the deprivation of oneself rather than focusing on the needs or experiences of others. So even though I overall agree with Kashiopo, I would probably argue that loneliness doesn't stem from, I mean, that stem from relational or lack of fulfilling relations. So loneliness is intimately connected to relationships, but I would still say loneliness is mm, self-oriented because it is not coming from the other oriented perspectives. So that's the only difference. And the common myth number two, loneliness means being alone. So again, this image shows when you put loneliness, it's like one person sitting alone, looking sad. So even though there has been increasing awareness of loneliness as more of the public health issues. There is still this understanding and a common you know, assumption that loneliness is about individuals. And I often say that being alone and feeling alone and being alone and being lonely are conceptually distinct. Loneliness and social isolation are not the same thing. Loneliness is an affective and subjective reality, while social isolation is a physical and social reality. So my favorite example is about, let's say, a monk who is on a solitary hat meditating for over 10 years. And such a monk says, well, I'm not feeling loneliness. I'm meditating on love, compassion, and you know, interdependence. So that means somebody can be physically alone and not experiencing loneliness. And opposite happens also. Sometimes you are surrounded by so many people. You are not living on your own. You are living with your family. You go to school you have a classmates and yet you feel really lonely. So loneliness is perceived and felt social isolation. So people can feel lonely when there is a lack of sense of being cared for by others. The sense of being acknowledged by others, the sense of being accepted by others, the sense of being loved by others are so important when you have the deprivation of such a feeling, people feel lonely. There is a lack of feeling meaningful to others that leads to the feeling of loneliness. And they are away from places or people to which they feel connected and where they feel belonging and at home. So I think this is one dimension that hasn't been explored all that much, but I think we all can think about places that we have strong connections with 
And this year with the COVID, that could have been a very challenging time, not being able to be at a place or places where we feel strongly connected. So now moving to what is loneliness? There's a number of definitions regarding loneliness. Uh, let me just uh, list a few very known definitions. Loneliness is a subjective experience involving perceived social isolation. This perceived social isolation is probably the most known definition of loneliness. Others like Perlman and Pepler define loneliness as the unpleasant experience that occurs when a person's network of social relation is deficient in some important ways, either quantitatively or qualitatively. The JAMAs uh, defined loneliness recently as a distressing discrepancy between desired and actual level of social contact. So I spent several years studying loneliness by other scholars. And my initial working definition was very similar to these above. Deprivation of a type of relationship that a person perceives as important to their happiness. But while analyzing my ethnographic data and writing my book, I realized actually my this earlier definition was more in, you know, kind of cognitively focusing on. It's like was seen primarily the cognitive dimensions of loneliness. So my definition in the end became this feelings of dissatisfaction that arise with regard to relationships to others or to the environment. Let me actually dissect what I meant by this definition. I say feelings. By using the term feeling, I emphasize that loneliness, even when it is experienced as a chronic state, comes and goes, ebbs and flows, and is impermanent, meaning that it's always in state of change. Loneliness is not just a psychological phenomenon, but a biological and social one as well. Loneliness can be felt in and by the body, even when it is not fully cognitively understood by the person who feels lonely and who struggles to put into words what they are feeling and experiencing. So loneliness is not just perceived or cognitive appraisal of one's situation and circumstances. Sometimes it happens so deep down at unconscious level that the people themselves are not aware that they are experiencing loneliness, but they are feeling lonely. So that is also important aspect of the embodied aspect of loneliness. And such feelings can result from loss, displacement, marginalization, not finding a place or niche of one's own or unmet expectations. Second, I'll say feeling of dissatisfaction. So here, by choosing the word dissatisfaction, I also aim to highlight the importance of society and culture in shaping expectations for relationships and happiness, often in idealized or unrealistic ways, including the idea that one should never feel lonely. By using the term relationships, I point to relational meanings, bonds, and sharing the word. By using the term or to one's environment, I point out that loneliness can involve not only the absence of satisfactory relationships with others, living beings, but also to social and physical places where one feels one belongs and where one feels at home. Again, you know, displacement, exile, forced migration, and refugee status can result in feelings of loneliness, 
our sense of belonging includes not just people, but also environments. This has largely been ignored in the literature, despite it's being a very common experience. Finally, um, by omitting the words and the individual's feelings, I aim to point out that loneliness can and often is experienced collectively, as paradoxical as that, that may sound, and that it, that it is shaped by processes that are not just individual, but social, cultural, and political as well. So I have been arguing already that loneliness is not just merely individual issues, but a social issues. Um, here, actually, I use the term, the lonely society, even though I realized actually I was not appearing the first person who is talking about lonely society. Um, anyway, this phrase, lonely society, is intentionally paradoxical. Society means people being together and living together, engaging socially. So to be in society means to not be alone. And yet it doesn't mean that one doesn't feel alone. There are certain condition of what I call the lonely society. And let me explain what I mean by the lonely society. So my book deals with, you know, this loneliness in a, at the social level. And in my mind, there are three types of societies which are lonely. The first condition is just a lot of people feeling lonely. So what we call the loneliness, you know, loneliness epidemics is probably talking about that. Let's say in the US, loneliness has been becoming an increasing issue, same as in the UK. The picture we have is, oh my goodness, what's wrong with our society? There are so many people who are lonely. But a second condition is, where the people in the society do not feel taken care of and cared for by society as a whole, and where the structures of society promotes a sense of loneliness rather than one of belonging and connection. So this case, you know, we are not putting the blame to individuals who happen to be feeling so lonely, and it happened to many of them in one society, but rather casting a question to the society, there's something about the social structures. Um, there's something about social affordance in certain society, the social values, ideology, that are promoting loneliness rather than belonging and connection. The third condition is a society or community that is lonely as a unit, in that it is not closely connected to other societies and to humankind as a whole, or feels abandoned, neglected, marginalized, or disenfranchised. So I would say the second condition, good example is unfortunately contemporary Japanese society where I have been spending the last 20 years studying observing. So I argue that when a society treats its members as having only instrumental value, as merely producers and consumers, then its members come see their worth only through the lens of their productivity or success. Sadly, Japan may not be the only exception, and I think uh, one of the new level of social values that the U America, US also embrace is this prioritizing the high productivity. When you do that, when the society does that, it hits hard on everyone when we get sick or when we retire, when we get old. Third condition may be in some way, maybe a little bit difficult one to imagine, but I often use example that I, can an individual be happy or sad? Of course. Can a couple be happy or sad? Of course. Then what about the family? What about the society? 
So I think uh, society or community that is lonely as a unit, uh, I, I would think, you know, maybe society that has been in the displacement or in exile, then it is quite likely for the entire communities to feel lonely and being abandoned. That's what I mean about the third condition. So in terms of how I do uh, about studying loneliness, so I actually always make a point of using and integrating film, television shows, and other media as social representations and social commentaries. But the studying suicide that then led to the study of loneliness really made me realize the importance of this triangulating three types of accounts. What I call the first person account is interlocutors themselves, how they think about the issues, how they feel lonely. And the second person account is forms of social commentary in popular media, including film, television, and the internet. So I would say the first person account and the second person account are experience near. First person account clearly experience near. Second person account, it's kind of addressing the audience as, hey, you. Like movies often do this way, uh, directors who are sympathetic to the condition of social malady might depict that in the film. So um, I think that is still experienced near. Third person account, research, statistics, media reports are experienced far. When I started studying this internet group suicide in Japan, I was actually really stunned by the huge gap discrepancy between uh, subjective experience of those who are frequently visiting suicide websites and the reports by mass media and even by social commentaries. Basically, um, experts, social commentary made the case of internet suicides as something very callous, shallow, people who are not even serious about what it means to die. And the meanwhile, that was not what I witnessed by following the first person accounts. So that really made me realize the importance of triangulating different voices, different accounts to give us better perspectives as researchers. And furthermore, so that actually it would help us to develop what I call critical empathy as a method. In today's talk, I wouldn't dig deep on this critical empathy, <clears throat> but in short, critical empathy means employing empathy as a methodology in the study of subjectivity with an awareness of both the promise and perils of empathy, its possibilities and its limitations. When I say critical empathy, this combines empathy with critical thinking, but this critical empathy doesn't mean being critical towards others but towards ourselves in our use of empathy itself, because empathy can go wrong. We can think we are emphasizing when we are not, and we can overemphasize or claim to speak for others when in reality, we never fully understand others 100%. So this is something I would like to talk more during the Q&A, but I think being a cultural anthropologist, empathy has been one of the very, thorny issue and many people write about their interlocutors and try to depict what they're experiencing but sometimes what we are doing might be just projecting our own biases our own cultural norms onto them and that is a failed empathy so therefore actually it is quite crucial to develop critical empathy if anyone is interested in studying subjectivity Finally, role of culture, um, very important. And when I say we need to shift from seeing loneliness as a mere an individual experience to a public health issue, inherently social and culturally shaped. First of all, you know, this dichotomy between individuals and society that is so arbitrary because 
we are all born within a society. So we are highly influenced by and conditions by society, community that we are brought up. So that's inevitable. I wouldn't say society within the individual. There is that component. So there is never a kind of se clear separation the way we might wish to have. Culture is shaped. I say your know, culture plays a crucial role in forming certain sets of expectation, experience, and expression of loneliness. For that reason, ethnographic studies of loneliness can shed light on the cultural shaping of loneliness experiences and expectations. Different cultures have maybe different norms about what it means to be happy. Like maybe in some societies, being physically alone and living alone is nothing but a very unhappy experience. And other societies might have the very different kind of cultural expectations. So it goes deep and deep in terms of how each culture, different cultures shape our expectations, therefore our experience, and even how we express loneliness. And of course, researchers need to develop critical empathy to approach subjective experience of loneliness. So I will say, trying to summarize what I have been arguing today, we think you know there are these two levels: cognitive conscious experience of loneliness and belonging. And secondly, there are affective felt somatic experience of loneliness and belonging. So we need to we need this like seismic shift actually in approaching loneliness. Why are researchers? Why are we relating to loneliness purely cognitively? Since we know people are social beings, affect matters, why not treat loneliness the same way? So we have to ignore the biological, developmental, and evolutionary roots of loneliness and have focused too much on the cognitive and conscious dimensions. Good example would be a baby crying for a mother. It is affective. Cats also cry for their owners. They feel loneliness. They're feeling loneliness, even though they might not be cognitively appraising their situation as X and Z. So I would say the second dimension between first and second is much more fundamental, much more primordial. One could say, for that reason, even more cross-cultural. Lesson two, um, social baseline theory sees tasks are easier when there are other people because it extends one's sense of self and lessens and reduce the cognitive load. So this is one reason why loneliness is so stressful. He experienced as a threat to survival here, my favorite example is a divorce. When a child experiences a divorce, when they are quite young, it disrupt, disrupts the sense of belonging. The extended sense of self is compromised. Divorce pushes children into experiencing loneliness and separation much earlier and force them to mature. Um, there is a reason why I included the image that has trees, not just many people. Here, I would like to add environment, not just having other people, as a part of personal resources and affordance, just like other people. I mean, their help matters to us. It reduces our sense of the burden, right? The mountain climbing, it seems so steep looks better when you have a pal, climbing partner. And then same goes for environment. I think we all have some experience when we are in a conducive environment, it is inducive, inducing a flourishing and opposite goes when we are put in the environment that is not suited for oneself, that leads to languishing and loneliness. So environment matter. 
finally, um, in terms of the solutions to the epidemic of loneliness, ultimately, it is about developing societies that promote certain sets of values, such as compassion, gratitude, that promote intrinsic value of human beings rather than instrumental value. Intrinsic value means it doesn't matter you are valuable or who you are, not depending on one's productivity and what's not. And here, there are a number of so-called contemplative practices. I think Emory has developed CBCT, cognitively based compassion training to enhance the understanding of compassion and interdependence to promote that the more sense of belongingness. My earlier work on the Japanese contemplative practice, Naikan does the same thing. And then now there is a new center at Emory, Center for Con um, Contemplative Science and Compassion-Based Ethics. And then they are developing C learnings for the K2 and 12 children. So I think education may be key for the future, I mean, promoting that the societies with this kind of body set. So finally, this is a link to my forthcoming book. So if you are interested in, you can even pre-order from Amazon. Um, but that's it uh, for today's talk. And thank you so much for your time. And I'm really excited to get any feedback, questions, and I'll stop sharing the screen here. An exciting presentation, and I know you're eager to uh, take questions. We do have uh, quite a few participants today, um, so I'm going to ask if people wish to uh, ask a question, if you could just uh, drop something into the chat. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the question, but just that you want to ask a question, and that way we'll have a queue of people um, and we can work through that. Um, so if you could go ahead and uh, if you would like to ask a question and I'll, uh, Chikako, I'll try to monitor the, the chat for you while you actually respond. And I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, just ask something that we uh, uh, talked about a little bit before that I'm uh, very interested in is just this idea of uh, universality. Um, and what does it mean to say something like loneliness is universal, what actually is shared uh, across people if there can be uh, such important social and cultural inflections on loneliness. So these, can you actually repeat your question? So are you asking about how universal is that or? Yeah, what does it mean to say that it's, it's universal? Clearly it varies, but what aspect of it, you know, is there some core to it or, you know, or is it sort of just a fuzzy associate? What is universal about loneliness? Yeah, yeah. So kind of going back to the one of the very early slides. So the way actually I came to really realize the universality, again, I'm a cultural anthropologist, so it's quite rare for me to make such a bold argument, is that, uh, you know, loneliness is uh, based on a biological, evolutionary, and a psychological foundation, right? So what I mean about it's universal is everybody has experience of being left behind feeling sad when somebody is not there. Like when we are baby, the moment, uh, well, assuming if your mother was the one who was raising you, when your mother is not around, baby feels a, being, a sense of being abandoned, unsafety. Actually, feeling unsafe is nothing but part of the loneliness experience. So that's what I mean. Loneliness maybe for many people might feel something, something, but a sense of not feeling secure, not feeling safe, that's also an anticipation of maybe being left behind. That's all part of our experience of loneliness. In that way, it happens to every single human being, not just human beings. If you are pet owners, we probably have experienced that with our dogs and cats. So in that way, there is a kind of biological base. We need to belong. You know, belonging is key for our survival. So we have a strong need for belonging. It's out of our necessity. And at the same time, the way our 
mind develops is nothing but kind of the idea of separating and differentiating ourselves from others. That's how we actually develop our sense of selfhood and identity. I am a unique individual, Kochi Kako, who is this and that happens because of differentiating myself from others. So this causes this tug of war. That's like the metaphor, I want to belong, but at the same time, I want to be different and separate. So that's part of actually the human condition. So for that reason, loneliness is just part of what it means to be human beings and probably mammals as well. So, and at the same time, you know, as I said, culture plays a major role, right? Like it really shapes certain cultural expectations and it norms. What kind of you know, situation will lead to loneliness or vice versa? So in that way, of course, in different cultures, loneliness expe expectations are different. Therefore, that influences our experiencing of loneliness. And furthermore, even how we you know, express loneliness might be very different as well. So. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, it looks like we've got now quite a few uh, <laughs> questions in the chat. So uh, um, the first one is from uh, Peter Brown. Uh, Peter, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Chicago. My, uh, my camera's not working, but uh, I was asked, wondering in terms of the risk of loneliness, in terms of life cycle, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in terms of gender. Uh, as you know, I'm interested in uh, male gender and health, and the some of the epidemiological data seems to say that men are more risk and uh, and the elderly. And in a society like Japan, where we have uh, a lot of elderly people, how does this relate to loneliness? Thank you, Peter, for your question and a very important one. Yeah, I didn't include that life cycle issue in as kind of, you know, the myth of loneliness. So in many actually literature and research, many studies on loneliness, well, also like loneliness and social isolation together, uh, often focus on elderly individuals. And there are many, many published research work and articles on loneliness among senior individuals. But then among actually loneliness uh, researchers, among experts, it is also known actually uh, puberty and adolescence is also a period where many people experience severe loneliness. And then some say actually it doesn't mean that actually it is so correlated with the aging. So when I was studying, it seems to be there is no clear correlation depending on your know, life cycle. This is the age we tend to feel very lonely. Though it is acknowledged that, you know, adolescence period and um, uh, old age seem to impact on the experience of loneliness. Again, that may be also related to the product, you know, this kind of um, the social values put on the productivity partially uh, for people who Mm, retire, sometimes that is known for causing the loneliness. And also the divorce, yeah, the divorce among that uh, so-called senior aged individuals in Japan that have been causing a lot of loneliness among men. This case, because most of the late life divorce have been like initiated by women. So in their case, women have contemplated on divorce for a number of years, if not a few decades. But that comes as a surprise and an unpredicted news to men. Do you, do you think that uh, in general, uh, let's say cross-culturally, women have more uh, dense social uh, networks than men? I mean, I think I know a lot of men who really have no friends uh, except for they're the husbands of uh, their wives' friends. Yeah, as that is not something I have any conclusive um, 
answer. So I will be just sharing my observation and thoughts on that. In general, I think that is a known phenomenon and I can probably pledge that being the case with my ethnographic studies of Japan. Um, at the same time, when I talk about social network and the relationships, so that's partially why I was including not just the relationship with people, but relationship with places and the environment. Um, what would be a good example? Let's say um, you're feeling lonely. And then maybe for some people, the way they try to rectify the experience of loneliness might not be from actively uh, trying to establish new human relationships, but by joining a um, group or the society, such as, you know, I'm just now bringing up my early childhood hobby, animation. That was something that was pretty much shared when I was a little kid. So I had some pause to like, would I want to share that or not? Um, but I really loved manga and animation. But once you join the group of this kind of, you know, people who like animations, then you are sharing what you care for with so many others who care for that. So it does not come, the sense of a connection may not derive from the in-person human connections, but actually societies or community can also serve that kind of um, relationship. So that's why I actually really wanted to expand what we mean by uh, personal resources and affordances. Maybe if you can have it with other people, you could have a relationship with something else or via virtual reality world where you really like to connect with. You know, even gaming, maybe. It's, I don't do the gaming, so I cannot really speak of that. But I often hear through gaming, they pe meet people who think alike, like similar things. From there, they can actually have the joy of sharing the world, <laughs> sharing the world with others. So that would be probably my current answer to your question. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks. And uh, next in the queue is uh, Cheryl Goodman. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I'm excited to learn more about this work. I actually had put in one question, but having, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, having heard what you just said, I have a different question, um, which is I wonder about the role of I was going to say religiosity, but I'm actually thinking about spirituality. So I'm, I'm not thinking so much in terms of the concrete uh, connection to other people, but more in terms of the, the way of thinking that can come with spirituality in terms of how one thinks about oneself in relation to a broader uh, humanity, self, non-self, uh, so forth. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your question. So, um, so how I understood your question is, what about spirituality? Does it play a crucial role in mm -hmm. establishing a sense of connection, belonging, meaning kind of almost antidote to the loneliness? Yeah, I'll definitely say, let me say yes, to that and the spirituality again, I would assume would connect you with maybe shared <clears throat> ideology or values among maybe others who also share the importance of when you're spiritual. I mean, there are many different kinds of possibly practices or sp spiritualities. Again, it is a form of belonging, it's, it create a certain kind of affordance. So I think, you know, when people are experiencing severe loneliness, it could be that the hurdle is so high to say, okay, you're feeling lonely, that's bad. Let's get connected with, you know, you know, so and so and so and so, why don't you call them? When they're experiencing loneliness, just like depression, right? In that case, if they could do that, 
that would be easy. But then again, therefore, spirituality could be that, you know, that's, that could be a way of connecting. It's that. And actually, I really, I'm not seeing uh, the other question you raised about uh, empathy. Yeah, I'm not sure that I understand when you add the word critical to, uh, to become this phrase critical empathy. I'm, I don't think I quite got yeah. what you were saying there. Well, thank you for your, this was really much the test run, you know, the book is not out and in the ideal world, you know, it would be wonderful for audience to have a chance to kind of read some sections because critical empathy is also, uh, yeah, something I clearly probably didn't give enough time to kind of dig deep. And major difference is, you know, when you talk about critical empathy, empathy has been highly valued and also questions within cultural anthropology. It's like almost like too much empathy is bad, but empathy is important. One thing when I say critical empathy as a, as a method is when I say critical, it's critical in the sense that when you talk about empathy, at least within the social, cultural, anthropological work. So it's like a, a researcher, me, having empathy towards my, you know, my interlocutors. I feel empathy towards my interlocutors. But what is not questioned so much is how does your interlocutor experience that? That aspect is important. Because if you think you're emphasizing with your interlocutors, but if it is not experienced mutually, that mm. is a kind of you know, failed empathy. And I think strangely, it's really, I mean, current scholarship, at least in my field, discipline, is strangely really neglected of this say. It's like, you know, it's, empathy is not one way relationship. It should be mutual, ideally. So that's one aspect of the being critical. And there are other aspects about, I mean, it's maybe related to what I said. Oftentimes, I feel some of the ethnographic work, what I see is projecting the researcher's personal distress onto their interlocutors. But when okay. I see the interlocutor's narratives, I am not entirely sure whether <laughs> that is what interlocutors are experiencing. And again, many researchers conflate this projecting their own personal distress with empathizing others. So, right. so the invitation is, is to us uh, to be more critical about our assumptions of empathy? Our assumption of our own sense of what it means to be an empathetic scholar. So that's why like when I say triangulating three different accounts, that gives some way of actually contrasting possibly three different accounts. That should give us some clue. And then on top of that, you can have your own evaluation. But I think more rigorous comparisons with the internet suicide, if I only relied on the social media and then social commentaries, that would give a very different picture from me also focusing on subjective experience by closely following uh, the so-called suicide websites. So that, that's the, yeah. Yeah, and we should Thank talk you. more. And uh, that, you know, that's something I'm super excited about. And I would like to actually develop more in my new book project on marriage and intimacy in Japan, because intimacy became one of the very important issue while thinking about and writing about loneliness. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Thank you. And so uh, I've noticed we've, we've reached five o'clock, but there's uh, still a lot of people here and there's still a lot of questions. I don't know, Chicago, if you'd be willing to answer a, a few more uh, questions or. Happy to do that. Yes. Yeah, at least at least a couple more. The, the next person is uh, Connie Allen. Hi, thank you. I appreciate your talk. It's been um, very thought provoking. Um, and I'm kind of You've touched a bit about the researcher projecting things onto others, and I'm still kind of struggling with the concept of how you measure that, especially when you project it outside of humans. I guess I was expecting 
something like a functional MRI as people were talking about different subjects to objectively look for activity in certain parts of the brain to define loneliness, but that's a, um, a very different background. So I was wondering how you measure loneliness. Um, is it, is there, are there more objective measures or is it all just self rating? And if so, how do you do the subjective when you're talking about the loneliness of animals and just looking at their behavior and not projecting your own feelings on how you think you would feel if you had that behavior? Well, thank you for your question. And then perhaps I won't be able to answer your question as we are joking between uh, Deet and myself. My work is literally outside of the lab. And for that reason, actually, I'm very interested in having an interdisciplinary kind of collaboration. And if there's something interesting, actually, I really would like to also collaborate on that. Saying that, you know, what I mean about um, how to manage loneliness, maybe we never use the word measure in uh, social cultural anthropology, but uh, and sometimes I know what we do with ethnographic study is kind of labels as anecdotal. I'm aware of that too. But when I was actually studying the initial phase on the internet group suicide, I spent maybe seven years identifying popularly visited so-called suicide websites, and I kind of narrowed them down to 40 of them. And I closely followed the posted, actually, you know, narrat narratives or na sometimes narratives, sometimes poems, how people who are regular suicide website vis visitors talk about their experiences. And when you're reading hundreds of them, thousands of them over a certain period of time, what I see is kind of, you know, bottom up, you know, it's like thick description. You start seeing emerging emerging themes are there. So initially when I was studying suicide, I was not necessarily focusing on loneliness per se, but it was rather by studying so-called, you know, suicidal individuals, what I realized was this pervasive sense of loneliness. Like I'm too lonely. I'm too lonely to die alone, something like that. Then you see, okay, they're saying they're lonely. But this the loneliness also is accompanied with the sense of not willing to die on their own. That's a whole story, you know, but that, that led to me exploring other dimensions. And I think my understanding of loneliness, you know, really is that uh, when you say loneliness, people might think that's some, something self-evident, but I actually really believe that we often do not know when we are lonely. There is a somatic level, right? Sometimes it's very obvious to other people, especially who are close to you. But you're like, it's just like, I'm not angry, I'm fine. But then they are exhibiting signs of you know, redness in the cheeks or something. So I think the loneliness also is, is deep. It's like has many, many layers. So that's why when I say loneliness is everyone's business is we all have the experience of feeling lonely. But again, the chronic loneliness is again, whole different level. And that's what is concerning. So when I say cats and dogs feel lonely, it's just you know, when you see babies crying for mother's attention, behavior speaking. And when I see, maybe I had a very strange cat my cat had really a number of ways exhibiting, do not leave me. Like literally when we have to leave, she will lie flat right in front of her front front door. Like you may not pass over me. Or if I start opening a suitcase, my cat used to jump into the suitcase, literally like pack me as well. So probably that's probably partially, you know, I was talking like, oh my gosh, this is so not just a human being's issue. It's like definitely at least I'm seeing in my cats. But again, you know, I am really, really excited with support opportunities and possibilities of doing uh, collaborations because I think loneliness is so deep and it's so important. One person and one discipline one set of methods and approaches cannot 
right kind of um, cover integrity of it. So thank you so much. So maybe next I have to think about measuring loneliness. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, next we have uh, Mel Connor. Hi, Chicago. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll put my video on for a minute. I have an unstable connection sometimes. The the uh, question I have is how you uh, think about the difference between loneliness and solitude. So, Mel, thank you for your question. Uh, it's nice to see you. Um, mm -hmm. So when you say solitude, are you talking about the physical solitude or experience of that uh, inner experience? Which I'm, ta one? I'm talking about people like like me who who get very uncomfortable if we don't get a lot of time alone pretty much every day. And all the people who seek solitude <clears throat> as uh, as a positive aspect of their mental health people who do gardening people who go sailing by themselves people who take walks and hikes by themselves people who engage in uh, many different kinds of creative activity um, which of, of necessity keeps them alone um, do you see the possibility of 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 solitude as a, as a positive aspect of, of mental health. Also, also of course, there there is a classical. Um, I don't know how psychologists think about it today, but there's a classical dimension of of of, of personality um, um, from introversion to extroversion, and that means people are, different people are likely to experience being alone very differently from from each other. Um, OK, yeah. Uh, maybe I was not clear enough in doing my talk. Yeah, I actually really differentiate conceptually between loneliness and then physical aloneness or physical isolation. They are highly, highly you know, related to, and oftentimes goes hand in hand. That's why there are many studies that are targeting on loneliness and social isolation. But um, as I said, you know, somebody could be in a solitude environment and flourishing and even like seeking this kind of the physical isolation intentionally. Like the writers, when I write, actually I really want to be in a cave. I go through the phase. I really do not want to interact with other people. I cannot even actually verbalize speak. It's very strange, like my mind go somewhere so internally and I need that solitude. But then that's like self-seeking, positively asking quality. And um, again, you know, as I think Mel, you explained it all. That was my example, you know, physical isolation and loneliness is different because physical isolation means some people are going to be feeling lonely and miserable, and it's not the case for others. The COVID year was very tough for many people. That's when I actually realized my true intro, uh, introvertedness. Me and my husband were not hit hard by this uh, social isolation. In the meanwhile, my husband and my father-in-law was experiencing severe discomfort and loneliness during this COVID year. So we are all different, but loneliness means, you know, feeling that, <laughs> feeling alone, feeling alone and being alone are not the same thing. So, yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. And I, I would just say that my experience of writing is very much like yours and 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 in my experience of of the pandemic and quarantine was was definitely not as uncomfortable as it was for for so many other people. Um, for one thing, we were together, but 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 for another thing, we both like a lot of time alone. Um, so yeah, and that, uh, that difference between uh, being alone and being lonely very very important thanks thank you 
Thank you. And uh, Chikaka, would you indulge us in one more question? Uh, uh, we have uh, one from uh, Syed Achan. Thanks. Thanks, Dietz. My question was answered already. Thank you, yeah, Chicago, but... for that fascinating talk. And congratulations on the book. I can't wait to see it in print. Congrats. Thank you, Syed. Yeah, I think that uh, you and Cher were in sync at the same question. I'm glad because I didn't quite know whether that is an aspect that would be intriguing for the you know, audience for today's talk. But if you're interested in, I would like to share at least like one chapter. Well, Syed, you read the entire thing, but you know, looking forward to discussing more. So I don't know, uh, Deet, whether you would like to have one more question or it's time to... What a wonderful talk. Uh... Chicago, you mentioned that some cultures and societies uh, sort of enhance loneliness among the populations and some don't. I was wondering, as just an outsider, it would be wonderful if you could just mention some examples from your research. I would appreciate it. Thanks again. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your question. I'll be, you know, actually how I argued were there are certain conditions like the societies that promote belonging, flourishing and endless loneliness and others do. And then I would say without any hesitance, Japan is sadly one of the, if not the leading country that is embodying the, what I call the lonely society uh, for a number of many reasons. I mean, that's actually a long story. I don't know whether I have time. So I'm talking about maybe it's partially part of the, what we call the neoliberal social values. So I would say many so-called hyper-capitalistic societies are unfortunately in the camp, which, which are societies that you know, induce small loneliness rather than the sense of belongingness and flourishingness. So Japan's case, you know, um, yes, it is a hyper-capitalist society, just like the US. The difference is that up until a few decades ago, the post-World War II Japan had this very, many of you probably know that uh, corporate, corporate family, meaning that, uh, uh, well, unfortunately often men, but anyway, graduate from the college, and then they'll be employed by a corporate company. Once a person, individual is employed, there is kind of lifetime employment. That's the, you know, that's kind of a, um, without any questions and a doubt, that is given, that was, that used to be a given condition. So you get a job, you are good for the rest of your life. So there is kind of a stable structure to this behind so-called Japan's miracle economic growth and flourishing through the 70s, 80s, and then up until the early 90s. But um, Prime Minister Koizumi is probably one known Prime Minister who kind of got rid of the sort of infrastructure of the Japanese economy and instead injected more of the neoliberal employment conditions. So in a recent Japanese society, this lifetime employment is no longer a given, no longer a norm. That has been impacting so many people that, uh, you know, the sense of like the value, like how people would value themselves in the past would be, well, company would take care of me as long as, as long as I'm a hard worker, faithful to my employ you know, employers, I am good. That kind of set value is now forced to shift to showing one's productivity, otherwise they might lose their jobs. So that is a very, very radically different kind of orientation that is even impacting on the kind of the marriage um, among many people. So that's partially why um, I mean, it's a pretty tough situation just seeing as a native Japanese myself. So that's, sorry for a long answer, but to say Japan, yes, US, UK certainly would fit into one of the societies that are currently promoting loneliness. 
Interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yes, and, and thank you, Chicago, for the wonderful talk and for being so generous with your time answering questions. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of interest and we can't get through all of them, but thank you for staying a bit late and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>